People like to think about the stock market, but I argue that it's a market of stocks, not a stock market. And in any stock market, there will be certain sectors that can be overvalued, undervalued, and fairly valued. One such sector that's starting to come into value where the prices are beginning to drop is the packaged food and meat sector. In this video, we're going to look at some of the prominent names in this sector and try to determine whether they're fairly valued, undervalued, or overvalued. And then we'll feature five of the prominent names in a more deep analysis. Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Carnivale, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer Software Tool, a.k.a. Mr. Valuation. In this video, we're going to look at the packaged food and meats, and we're going to look at, at a very high level, about 14 of the more prominent companies. We're not covering them all. We're just looking at some of the more prominent companies in the sector. And the couple of things they have in common, they've all seen their, price, their prices drop. But I want to make a point. Not all price drops are the same. It depends on whether a stock is dropping from overvalued, being fairly valued, or even already being undervalued. Those things will make a major difference in what type of rate of return you could expect going forward. So let's take a look and get into a, first of all, a high-level overview of these 14 prominent companies. Using the portfolio review function of Fast Graphs, I've listed these in order of estimated annualized rates of return from highest to lowest. And I also want to make a point. The ones I'm going to cover are the ones that offer these highest rates of return. All right, some of these don't offer a good rate of return. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to start looking at these stocks in alphabetical order and talk about them just from a high level view of what we learned from looking at the Fast Graph historically. So we'll start with ConAgra Brands. A couple of things that Fast Graphs immediately tells me. This has been a low growth stock. Historically, it's only grown at 2.7% with a moderate amount of cyclicality. And it's typically traded somewhere between 13 and a half to 14 times earnings-ish. The orange line in this graph is a P of 13.9. The blue line is 13.46. Based on that, the stock was reasonably valued in May and it's now dropped in price and it's become undervalued. Okay, and we'll be talking about that. So here's a price drop from fair value to undervalued. The next stock we're going to look at is Campbell Soup. It also has a relatively low growth rate, about 3.65%, maybe a little more consistent. Once again, we're looking at two valuation references here. We're looking at a normal PE, which is averaged about 16 and a half and then a fair value PE of 15 based on a company growing at 3.65%. So it would command slightly higher valuation than we saw with ConAgra. So these are valuation references, but if you look at stock price, you clearly see overvaluation, undervaluation, overvaluation, undervaluation. The point being is the stock price eventually tracks the company's operating earnings here. And in this case, Campbell Soup actually started, if I go to the same time frame in May of 2023 from being overvalued, and it's now fallen to being fairly valued. But that's different because of the valuation differences that we saw with ConAgra based on the Campbell Soup. Now looking at Dannon, which is you know obviously the yogurt company, here we see again a low growth rate of 3.8%, but we see actually a lower growth rate if we shorten the time frame. This stock's only been growing about 1% since you know 2011 or 12. So here we have a really a different picture, but if looking at it from evaluation, it has fallen from being overvalued to now starting to look like it's being fairly valued. But just because a stock is fairly valued doesn't mean it's a good investment. I'm going to make that clear. Looking at flowers, foods here, the market likes to put a premium valuation. They've put a 22 multiple on this stock. Don't really have an answer as why it does that. But that is the case. So from that perspective, it fell from being fairly valued to undervalued. But note, the stock has never traded at the 15 PE. That's something you should be taking into consideration if you're considering this stock as an investment. The next one I want to look at is General Mills. Now, General Mills started out somewhere around April or May of this year being significantly overvalued. It's fallen precipitously into fair value, but it's not really gotten where I would call it significantly undervalued yet, but it's certainly a better buy today than it was in April or May of this year. The next stock we're going to look at is Gruma, which is a Mexican company, and you can see it's had a very, you know, kind of a cyclical past. It's paid dividends, it's reduced their dividends, it's even cut their dividend. 
that more recently it's been on a pretty good growth movement. So if I look at the last you know seven years or so, which includes some estimate data, the company's been growing pretty fast, but it's overvalued. The price has dropped a little bit, but I would still call this stock overvalued. The next one I want to look at is Hormel. And I want you to note that Hormel is another company that the market has, other than coming out of the Great Recession for a couple of years, the market has always put a premium valuation on this stock. But note when the valuations got really high, first of all, when the valuation was really high back in 2016, you know, the stock hasn't really performed very well for all those years. And then certainly if I look at high valuations, you know, that were occurring here, the stock still hasn't performed very well during these periods of times, a negative rate of return. Valuation matters and it matters a lot. So even though Hormel has fallen a great deal, I would argue it's been overvalued. And I'm basing that on the market putting a premium 20 PE. So it's, you know, it hasn't even got down to a 20 PE. It's still trading at a 21 PE. I consider this a really great company, A minus rated, only 21% debt to capital. But I still think we have valuation issues with Hormel. Hershey is another one that the market puts always has put a premium valuation. It was significantly overvalued, you know, back in April and May of this year. It's fallen to below its typical normal PE that the market, premium PE that the market has applied. But I still wouldn't call Hersey, you know, attractively valued. But if you're willing to take the risk of paying these higher average multiples, Hershey may be making some sense now. This is Kellanova, the old Kellogg. Again, kind of a you know slow growth company. You know, come from just really since the Great Recession, it's only been growing about one percent. Based on the market putting a premium value of around sixteen point eight nine, the stock has fallen precipitously. So I want to make something clear: Fastgraphs is revealing valuation; it's not dictating it. Formulaically, a one percent grower should only trade using the Gram dot format at about eleven point seven percent. Now, a fifteen PE is normal. You've heard me say that. So a 16.89 includes some of these high valuations, but you'll see the 15 PE ratio that I like to talk about has been relatively common on Kellanova, the previously known as Kellogg. Looking here at Carry Group, going into the max, once again, we have a stock that was massively overvalued. This is an Ireland company. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. You can see it was massively overvalued, very poor performance, a lot of volatility. It has fallen from being overvalued, and I would still not call it attractively valued, even though it has fallen rather dramatically since, you know, April or May of this year. All right, the next one we're going to look at at a high level is Mondelez. And Mondelez, again, premium valuation on this stock. You know, it's a triple B rated company, you know, 2.7% dividend yield. It was really overvalued. It's now coming into the market's normal valuation of 19 times earnings. Only during the Great Recession could we buy the stock at a more rational 15 PE. So that's, again, something you should be noting if you're looking. Then McCormick, the spice company, very overvalued for many years here. It's a little better grower, 7% grower. If I shorten that time frame a little bit, the growth rate has slowed down. And yet this was during the period of the highest valuation. It has fallen dramatically, but it's not gotten to what I would call fair value yet. And if I look at the max, you know, you could have bought it at a fair value P.E. ratio ish, you know, coming out of the Great Recession. But otherwise, you would have been having to pay this 20 plus multiple to buy the stock. But if you did buy it at that 20 plus multiple, you would tend to participate fully in the 7 percent growth of the company plus dividends. So I do want to make that clear, but you would be taking more valuation risk than I think you should. Nestle is about another 7% grower, a very similar story to what we just saw. It was overvalued. It's coming into you know fair value based on a normal premium multiple that the market wants applied, but I don't consider it cheap yet. Tyson Foods is interesting in that you know the stock has typically traded around 15 times earnings, but we had this huge collapse in earnings from $8.73 to $1.23, and the stock obviously reacted. This is giving us the highest future projected rate of return. I'll point that out here in a minute. But we're looking at, you know, it recovering back to more normalized earnings. And it's expected to do that. But even by the September fiscal year 26, 2026, it's only expected to earn 646. And it was earning over $8, you know, back in 2021 and 2022. Okay, so that's kind of a high level look at these stocks. Now, what I want to do here is I want to introduce some features of the fast graph tool that we've added in our latest upgrade. And I'm 
you know, we have a video out on that if you've all seen it, but we're going to look at that from the standpoint of using the tool in the portfolio view, no matter what view you're in, and you can work on creating better views, but you can watch the video that Colton did to basically see how that's explained. If you simply hover over the company stock symbol in a portfolio, it will give you a pop-up showing the last you know five or six years of the company's earnings. It will also give you a company description and just give you kind of a quick glance. So you can go through each of these companies and you can read the descriptions of what they do here just by clicking this feature. This is a an important new feature of fast graphs. Okay, but I do want to make a real strong point here. I'm going to look at primarily the four companies I'm going to focus on are Conagra, Campbell Soup, Kellanova, which is the old Kellogg's, and General Mills. I'm going to focus on these by looking at how you would decide whether or not you want to invest. These are the ones that offer double digit returns. Tyson is more of a speculation recovery, as I pointed out in my earlier remarks. But what I really want to do here is make a couple of points. So I'm going to start with Conagra. Okay, we're going to go ahead and click into the company. And again, we looked at the history. We learned the company is a relatively slow grower. We learned that the market has, you know, typically appraised it at a relatively low multiple, somewhere around, you know, 13 and a half to 14 times earnings. So we now know that. All right. And we know it doesn't have a whole lot of growth. And even if we change time frames, we can see that the growth rates of this company have been, you know, sometimes you know, a little better than others, but I call this one year out. Now we're down to 4% growth. So, you know, using this to analyze what the growth is historically. But you, although you can learn a great deal by studying the past of any company, it really comes down to the forecasting. And one of the things we've really done in the forecasting feature of Fast Graphs is we've basically expanded a little bit, give you some insights. Now, you know, people have accused Fast Graphs of being a backward-looking tool. It's not. It's, I think it's one of the best forward-looking tools there are because I want to point out it's the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool, and it's a tool to think with, and it allows you to do very quick what-if calculations based on the consensus of the leading analysts that are following the company. And we're using FactSet as our data provider, FactSet Research Systems, you can see here at the bottom of the graph, and they have collected the estimates of 15 leading analysts that are following ConAgra, okay? And those analysts six months ago were basically forecasting 285. The current forecast is now 268. So that forecast has dropped. But the new feature we've added, you can go back and click this six-month tab and note the growth rate here. The estimated growth rate is 2.42%. That's adding up three, three numbers right here and, you know, giving us an estimate of what the future growth would be. But if I looked at it six months ago, when the estimate was higher than it is today, that growth rate would have been 5%, okay? And so I can now look at what the estimates looked like previously, three months ago, six months ago, and now currently. And of course, I want to work in currently. But what this tool does, I want to kind of focus on this tool a little bit more. This tool is giving you the ability to kind of run very instantaneous calculations of what future rate of return you might be able to make if the numbers that, that the analysts are currently portraying come out, come to pass. By scrolling down, you also have the analyst scorecard. And the analyst scorecard allows you to determine on a one-year forward forecast with a 10% margin of error, on a two-year forward forecast with a 20% margin of error, how accurate analysts have been. And you, you can look at the actual numbers in the detail here so you can comprehensively get a feeling. Now, in ConAgra's case, you know, they've hit estimates 17% of the time. They've beat estimates 58% of the time. And they've missed estimates 25% of the time. And you can see those misses here. And this, again, is with a 10% margin of error. They've actually done a little better with a higher margin of error on the two-year forecast. And you can see those areas where they missed and by what magnitude they did miss. So the idea here is I would have a reasonably high confidence factor that these estimates are probably correct. But what we have here are parallel lines. Now we've got five orange lines, two light above a dark orange line, two light orange lines below. And these are parallel lines that represent different future PE ratios based on these specific analyst estimates. So all you have to do if, you know, you go to the normal 13.34, you know, multiple that's in historically accurate with ConAgra and just simply point to this triangle, the pop-up says, if all these things occur, these are what-if calculations you're doing, 
then this is what the numbers would look like if it traded at a 13.34 PE ratio by fiscal year May 31st, 2026 year end. From here, you could make 18.56% annualized. That means your number would be, your $10,000 would go to $14,000. That would give you 42% growth. Your annual rate of return would be 14.2%. You add in dividends, not reinvested in this example, but just add in the dividends. That means your $10,000 would have given you $15,667 in value, and that would be an 18.56% rate of return. Now, you can also do what if. You can do best case and worst case scenarios. It's currently trading at a blended PE of 10, okay? So what if it only traded at a 10 multiple? You've got those numbers here. A 10.67 multiple would be 9.9%. It would still give you a pretty decent rate of return. A 9.3 multiple would still give you 5%. So you could even get some P-E ratio contraction here and still end up making a little money on this stock because it does have a margin of safety being undervalued. It's actually you know, below the two lower corridors of valuation. These are simply allowing you to be a calculator. We call these the forecasting calculator, okay? And they allow you to do quick calculations. And, you know, let's look at some historical stuff here now. There have been times where the market put a 22 multiple on ConAgra, you know, or a 20-ish multiple on ConAgra. So if I went into forecasting here, if it went into a 20 multiple, then, you know, I could make 36%. So that would be an aggressive assumption. But I have an idea here. I know the company's not going to grow very fast. I've got a good margin of safety that gives me the opportunity for some nice P-E ratio contraction, and I've got a 5% dividend yield. And if I look at the performance history, the dividend of this stock has grown at around 3 or 4%, 3 and 3.3% on the average growth rate, 279 on the compounded average growth rate. And by the way, that's pretty consistent with what the company's historical growth rate has been. Okay, so ConAgra could be, if you're an income-oriented investor right now, and you've got a 5% current yield with some capital appreciation, that would be the difference between why buy this instead of a bond, because you would stand to make some profit here for at least the next couple of years. Plus, you could um, also pick up a nice dividend yield that's growing at probably better than the inflation rate currently. But now when I go into forecasting graphs, I want to make another point about this. I'm looking at running these calculations. I can look at what my return might be for the next year or the next two years. Okay, and I can do all of these what-if calculations on the fly instantly. So I'm not just buying and hoping. The 2.42% is consistent with the company's historical growth. If I went into the normal multiple of 14, that would give me a little more conservative look at what the stock might be. There's pretty close to that 10 multiple. That's a 9.97. I'd be able to earn 7.42%. So I can do some analysis here. Now, I can also use the five-year historical growth rate which is what Ben Graham talked about. In this case, I think it would be kind of aggressive, all right, to look at that. But anyway, that's ConAgra, looking at ConAgra. The next one we want to look at, going back to the portfolio theory, we want to look at Campbell Soup. Now, I can use the pop-up. I get a description of what Campbell Soup does. You know, it operates under the meals and beverages and snack segments. You know, we all obviously had a can of Campbell Soup at one time or another. But if we click into the expanded graph here, now we can look and, again, learn from the history of Campbell Soup. And what we can do is we can learn that the company's been a moderate grower. Watch what happens when I change time frames. I had a pretty good growth period here. I start calling those out. Now I'm only getting about 2% growth historically, you know, going back to 2011 or so. So I should know that. Now this company has a July fiscal year. That's important to note. It does pay a 3.75% dividend, and it was overvalued. It's now coming into fair value territory, which is about a you know 12.68 PE for a 2% grower. So it's not even the 15 PE. Now, if I go to the forecasting graph, and again, I go to current, I want to be clear, don't get caught. It should be defaulting to current, but it was on three months. And three months ago, they were expecting at the analyst, the 15 analysts that follow this company, were expecting three. 15. Then they dropped it to 307. Now they're back to the 315. So the three months ago and the current number are relatively similar, but there's slight difference. Notice that the estimate numbers change. So currently, Campbell Soup has a very modest margin of safety. A 15 PE would be good. 
the normal multiple is about 15.6. So again, these are 15 HPE, kind of makes a sensible thing to calculate. If I looked going forward, I could make a double digit rate to return with a 3.75% growth rate. If I look at performance, my dividend's grown about 2.5%, 2.23%, about in line with the growth of the business. So, you know, would you want to invest in Campbell Soup here? Personally, I'm not really attracted to it, but if I go to the forecasting calculator, analysts are expecting some decent growth in 2025 and 2026, which would, you know, give it this double digit rate of return. So for some of you, it may be attractive on that basis, considering it's a triple B company and it's kind of a stalwart brand. So that's my take on Campbell Soup. You know, looking at it, I learned from the past, but I invest only in the future. The next one I want to look at is Kelanova. And again, I get a description of what they do. You know, they spun off one of their, you know, some of their products here. Again, it's a relatively low grower. More recently, since coming out of the recession, it's been a very slow grower. That's why this function of being able to change is so critically important. And by the way, one thing that we have added, if you click this little button here, if you want to look at specific dates, you know, here you look at a 1231, 2011, you can use this scroll bar here and go back to like, for example, if you want to exclude all the estimate data, you're looking at 1231-2011 to October 12, 2023, which has been, you know, still using current numbers without the estimate data. So you can play around with that a little bit too at your leisure. And then of course, don't forget to unclick that so that you can use your regular normal fast graph iterations, but going into forecasting, analysts are expecting a 4.4% growth. That would indicate a 15 PE. The normal multiple on this stock for the last five years has been a 16 PE, but you can also use this drop down. There's a lot of functionality in the forecasting calculator and look at different PEs over you know, longer periods of time if you want. And a 16 or 17 PE has not been uncommon for this stock. So, you know, if you're willing to make that consideration and say, I think a 16 P would be good, this could give you a 20% annualized rate of return. If you were using the normal 15 PE, and again, using the current number, I got to be careful to do that. It'd be about 11.8%. You know, analysts went from 380 to 384 to 389. So for 2023, they're getting a little more positive, but for 2024, they're getting a little more negative, and for 2025, they're getting more negative. So if I looked at six months ago, you know, the analysts were expecting four and a quarter percent growth. But if I look currently, they're actually expecting negative growth for the next two or three years, and that changes the calculations and evaluations. But again, these are what-if calculations that allow you to understand exactly what your rate of return potential might be given these numbers and these valuation parameters. Okay, I want to make that clear. Okay, the next one we're going to look at is General Mills. And this will be the last one I'm going to look at regularly here for you. Again, historically, this has been one of the better growers in the packaged food industry. It's been one of the more consistent growers. If I look at performance, you know, the dividend has grown about 7% a year. Because of that faster growth, I think that's very important. The stock has traded. You have been able to buy this at a 15 multiple on numerous occasions. But the market has liked to put a premium valuation. You know, these are facts I'm looking at. You can think about those facts in any way you want to, but they're just facts. And you're given that information so, so instantaneously with the fast graph. If I shorten the time frame, growth rate has slowed a little bit like it did with others. It's grown slowed from 5.91. If I use 10 years, which includes some estimates, it's 5.44. Growth has been pretty consistent with this company all in all. If I go to the forecasting graph, we're expecting more of the same. Again, if I go, that was three months ago. If I go to the current graph, 4.9%. You know, the previous graph is 4.93. The current graph is 4.93 because the numbers ended up being the same. If I look at three months ago, it was 5.20. The numbers were just slightly higher, 4.51 instead of 4.49, which is the previous estimate. Six months ago, analysts were expecting 6.5% growth. So, you know, they're becoming a little more benign, went from 476 on the 2025 number to 476 now. So they're maintaining 25 and 26. You can just handle it. You can, again, look at analysts have been 100% hits on this company with these margin of errors. So that tells me it's an easy company to analyze. I would put a great deal of credence in these potential estimates, and I would feel very confident 
about calculating different rates of return. Using a normal multiple of 6.78, I could make 14.71% over the next two and three quarter years. Remember, this has a May fiscal year. If I'm looking at you know a more reasonable 15 PE, I could still make double digit rates of return. The current PE is 14.36, you know, so I could, you know, even manipulate these and try to come up with a PE ratio that does that. But the point is, I've got a great deal of confidence in General Mills. I would like to see it cheaper than it is right now, personally, but you at least know what you could expect from General Mills. Historically, when the company, you know, has fallen below the orange line at times, which is a 15 PE, there have been a rare occasions, but normally a 15 PE would have been an attractive time to buy this stock to full Fully participate in its growth plus get dividend income. And I want to talk about the rates of return for a minute. The rates of return are going to be a function of the growth that the company is capable of, of achieving going forward. In this case, we're looking at you know just under 5% plus the dividend yield, which is 3.67% plus a slight PE ratio contraction, which would get you up to 10%. So you're looking at 5 plus 4 plus a little smidgen of PE ratio expansion. Would love to buy this company a little cheaper. Now, as a bonus, I am going to take a look at Tyson. I told you I would look at Tyson, you know, but it, the thing is, this is more of a speculation. Tyson has run into some real operating trouble that got the stock price down really low. It's trading at what appears to be a real high valuation. That's based on current earnings, which have been abysmal. The earnings fell 86%, but looking outward to the future, the PE ratio, you know, at today's Current price would be closer to about maybe 15 or 16 times earnings. The forward PE would be closer to 15. And then the forward PE going out to 2026 would be about a 14.36 PE. So that would be very attractive. Looking at forecasting, the company is expected to grow at a very high rate. But I, I want you to understand that there's a lot of iffiness in here. If I look at the analyst estimates, they have been reasonably accurate with this company. So that's something. So this could be one that you might really want to take a look at because we're expecting 140% growth this year. But all that is, is it's beginning to recover back towards more normalized earnings growth. And so we're looking at the next year, looking at 26% growth following 142%. Again, that's just more reverting back to its normal you know, multiples. Then we're looking at 72% growth going back. But again, that those numbers look big. But what you're really looking at here is the company kind of reverting back to more normalized levels of earnings that it's capable of generating. The company has maintained a dividend throughout all this. So this could be a very interesting speculation, but it is a speculation. Anyway, this has been Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs. I hope you got a little more insights on how to use the FastGraph tool. By the way, it's a starting point for research. You should never make decisions, even on those forecasting calculators. We provide external links that allow you to go into the company's website and learn more about the company. We, we give you access, direct access to other research. You might Some of them you might have to subscribe to, though, I'll tell you. But the point is, this is a tool to help you make better investment decisions quicker, easier, and more efficiently than ever before, plus with more insight about the companies that you're you know, endeavoring to invest in or considering investing in, you can know a lot more about the nature of the beast, if you will, by utilizing the FastGraph tool correctly. If you like this video, give me a like, ring the bell, you know, subscribe to the channel and take a, you know, look at subscribing to FastGraph. So we're constantly adding new features and we've got many, many new features, including some real exciting portfolio enhancements coming up in the future. Thanks for watching and uh, be talking to you again real soon.